May the Lord be with you. This is Pastor Ryan Stout for St. Peter's and Nidaros Lutheran Churches. I'm here in this video with a reading and homily for the 17th Sunday after Pentecost. A reading from the book of Jonah. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? This is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life away from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, we pray for the preacher, for you know his sins are great. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When's the last time that you read the book of Jonah? I'm willing to bet that it's been a while. Sunday school, perhaps. Due to its fantastic imagery and the prominence of a whale or giant fish within the narrative, we tend to relegate it to a children's tale, which is a pity, because for as short as this story is, it contains a message that every religious adult ought to hear. It's a dark comedy. The book of Jonah is a joke, containing elements both of humor and of horror. It's a four-chapter satire setting up a punchline, but what a punchline it turns out to be. Poignant enough to have secured its place firmly in the scriptures of Jews, Christians, and Muslims alike. Our eponymous prophet was active in the 8th century BC during the height of the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrians, you have to understand, are the villains of the Bible. They may not technically be the first empire in history, but they're the first one of note. And nobody liked these guys. They're credited with the invention of crucifixion. When conquering a territory, they would deport the population, all but the very poorest, then bring in and mix up displaced peoples from various other locales that they'd conquered. It was an ingenious way of preventing rebellion. It was also cultural genocide. And that's precisely what would happen to Israel in the year 722 BC. The northern kingdom, centered on Samaria, would be wiped out. Its people, scattered to the winds, forever after known as the Lost Tribes. And the southern kingdom of Judah would only be saved by some sort of miraculous plague felling the Assyrian army. Anyone reading the book of Jonah would know this. Anyone reading the Bible would know this. For Israelites, the Assyrians, and especially the Ninevites of Assyria's capital, were the Nazis of their day, the ISIS of their day, the big bad. Little wonder, then, 
that when God calls Jonah to prophesy the destruction of Nineveh, Jonah immediately skedaddles in the opposite direction. Not only that, he books passage on a ship and sails for Tarshish, which is the furthest port that anyone had ever heard of. It's funny, really. The cowardly prophet, afraid to plunge into the proverbial hornet's nest in order to prophesy their doom, yet as he flees from his duty, he cannot flee from God. An unnatural storm seizes and tosses the ship about, threatening to dash it to pieces. All of the sailors panic, each calling upon his God, and this is scary stuff. To the ancients, the sea was a chaotic and terrible place. Impious was he who first spread sail and braved the terrors of the frantic deep, according to Caesar Augustus. The last thing that one would expect of our prophet in such a situation would be to find him fast asleep in the hold, untroubled by the wrath of God and fury of the waves. Yet there he sleeps. And when the crew draws lots to determine just who it is amongst them who has angered someone's God, Jonah says, Hi, it's me. I'm the problem. It's me. When they then ask him how they ought to proceed, he tells them to simply throw him overboard and all the storms shall cease. Honestly, he sounds bizarrely nonchalant. Note that they are reluctant to do so, and when pushed by extremity, beg God's forgiveness. The pagans, the heathens, are the pious ones, the ones with moral qualms, while Jonah continues to defy the will of God. Over they heave him, and the waves are still. Down, down sinks Jonah, down into the house of death, down to Davy Jones. And there in the abyss, Jonah calls out to God for deliverance and is promptly swallowed by a fish. And the fish is not the punishment, you see. The fish delivers the prophet from a watery grave. There are accounts of such things happening, mind you. When I lived in Boston, I would visit the New Bedford Whaling Museum, a vaguely terrifying place that one entered through the jaws of a leviathan. There I read eyewitness reports of men swallowed by whales, only to be cut out later, horrified but still breathing, their skin reduced to the consistency of paper by stomach acid. Jonah spends three days and three nights in the gullet of a sea beast. And there he sings. At the end of his undersea journey, he's then vomited up on the shores of, who'd have guessed it, Nineveh. And this too contains a wry and gallows humor, for the people of Nineveh worshipped a West Semitic fertility god named Dagon, and Dagon was represented iconically as a man emerging from the mouth of a fish. Now that ought to ring a bell. The Ninevites in our story would think that Jonah is a god. Having gotten their attention, he then preaches the shortest and lamest sermon ever recorded in the Bible, Forty days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's it. That's all he seems to say to a city so enormous that it takes him three days to walk about it. And having done the absolute bare minimum required by his job, Jonah then finds a hill with a nice view of the city and sits down to watch it burn. But against all odds and against common sense, the Ninevites listen to Jonah, even the king upon his throne. They all repent in sackcloth and ash. The whole metropolis listens to Jonah's lackluster warning. A single drop of judgment brings Assyria to her knees. And so God also repents, as it were, and turns from the destruction he'd intended for the city. The whole thing is satirical. The whole thing is a farce. At every stage, it upends expectations, confounding the audience, humiliating the prophet, and uplifting unbelievers. We even have a sea monster who saves the day. And so now, finally, we're ready for the punchline. 
Now, finally, we've come to Jonah's point. I knew it! The prophet calls out in his rage. I knew that this would happen from the very start. I knew, O oh Lord, that you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and relenting from punishment. That's why I ran. That's why I took off for Tarshish and threw myself into the sea, because I knew that you would forgive them, and I want to see them all burn. That's the twist. Throughout this whole narrative, the entire book of Jonah, we thought that a pusillanimous prophet fled from a wrathful, angry God. But just the opposite is true. The point of the book of Jonah is that we are the unforgiving ones. We are the wrathful ones. We want to see our enemies punished and the wicked all burned to the ground. Thus we flee from the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, because we know that he will forgive the people whom we hate and will be damned if they get grace too. God is not the monster here. Humanity is. We are. We resist grace with everything we have, even unto death, even unto the abyss. Yet death itself cannot prevent the love and grace of God. He will pull us up from the waters, up unto everlasting life, and we will sing. The parallels with Jesus Christ are not all that hard to discern. Jesus, too, rests soundly while a storm threatens his boat. Jesus outright tells us that we would have the sign of Noah three days in the land of the dead to rise on the third as a god. Even the parable this morning contains much the same message that we as a people of God are fine when we receive his grace, his generosity, his mercy, his blessing. That's all well and good. But when others receive the same, then we think we have been wronged. Can God not do what he wants with his own? Or are we jealous because Jesus is good? So often in his parables, it seems that the only way to be excluded from the kingdom of God is for us to exclude others. That's what casts us out, what separates us from grace. Yet even then, there is repentance. Even then, Christ comes to find his lost and wayward sheep. It's not that we have to love others as a condition or requirement or test to earn the kingdom of God. It's that loving others is the kingdom. Loving others is salvation. To withhold grace, to withhold forgiveness, even and especially from our enemies, is to misunderstand fundamentally who God is and what Christ has come to do. In liberating others, God is liberating you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.